I'm going to speak um, a bit about some of my work in Egypt and Sudan and some of the um, evidence that we have for daily life in ancient Egypt. I'm afraid I'm not so interested in your pharaohs and your big important folk. I like the everyday ordinary folk and that's kind of what I want to speak about this evening. So, and luckily, Egypt is really rich in lots of really nice imagery. So we're going to have a feast, I hope, this evening for the eyes. Uh, so hopefully my clicker will work. Yes, OK. <laughs> so um, there is this common, popular, I want to say misconception a bit that the ancient Egyptians were obsessed with death. And I think um, we get this idea that why would, why would the kings and the elites spend so much effort or indeed the ordinary folks' effort in building these, these huge pointy things, these pyramids, these sphinxes and constructing monumental tombs, temples and the like if they weren't a bit morbid? But um, tonight what I'm going to try and uh, showcase is that the reason why they spend so long making these monuments was because they enjoyed their life so much instead. So you can be um, forgiven there as well for thinking that the Egyptians were a bit death obsessed and it's always what your P5 students want to go and look at as part of their curriculum at primary school. It's the mummies, where are they? And, and there's this obsession with looking at Takabuti in particular, the mummy on display. Um, and I think as well that part of the issue with that is, is that most of the artifacts in museum collections are the result of excavations that happened in tombs um, uh, rather than in settlements. And well, the reason for that really is that if you can work out where the tomb is, the tomb is more likely to be filled with lots of really beautiful items. Um, and indeed the, the G word, the gold. And that's often where we get um, quite interested uh, as archeologists in the past at least. Now we're starting to get a bit more interested in kind of the more muddy brown things, the settlement areas and the sort of broken bits of pottery and the broken um, uh, jewelry. But um, we, you know, we do know from, um, from mummies and from, uh, from bodies that you can get some information for, off, off of how they lived. You can look at their teeth and work out through strontium isotope analysis where they grew up from the water that they were drinking. You can look at their bones to see did they have an easy life or were they toiling in the fields all day. Um, you can look at their stomach contents and see if they were eating a good well-rounded diet or did they have a lot of parasites going on, did they have worms, we can work all this out. Um, but that's not something that I'm particularly interested in, but they are in the Ulster Museum, so you can go and see about Takabuti there um, if you're interested. But if we contrast to what we know about ourselves when, when our deceased people pass away, we don't get a lot of information. This is um, my ancestral grave uh, areas, so, uh, and all we can really tell from them is that they were deceased, their dates of birth and their um, dates of death, um, what their names were, and in the case of one of my grandfathers that he was the harbour master at Port Rush. Um, but what they doesn't really tell you um, is that uh, my, you know, my grandfather was really interested in hockey, he really loved eating boiled sweets and, um, and you know, that he was a uh, you know, great fun to be around. I sadly didn't meet him because he was uh, passed away before I, I was born, but it's only through the kind of cherished memories from my family that, and photographs that their memory is kept alive. However, with um, ancient Egyptians, they uh, had a lot more um, ways of showcasing the, the, their deceased people um, and their interests as well. And that all presents ourselves in this sense of archaeological bias. So we know a lot about tombs and about the ancient Egyptians 
way of, of dying and their funerary, the funerary goods that they decided to, that their ancestors decided to place in the tomb with them. But as archaeologists in the past, um, we have tended to go and, uh, and hunt down these tombs because we knew in the past that lots of museums would want to fill their collections with those lovely objects because they tend to be more complete. Um, you tend to have complete vessels, complete jewellery, and it makes a beautiful display case. Um, however, that has, has its own problems, and that in particular that then led to museums wanting um, in the 18th and 19th centuries when they were actively a being constructed mostly and b actively collecting and when they were allowed to at that stage wanted items from Egypt and they targeted or they sought out archaeologists who were really excavating tombs because of these whole complete items that they could fill their museums with and that led to a bias for more archaeologists then getting paid to go and work in tomb areas, dig up pyramids and the like, and just focus on excavating tombs. So that then meant that museums got filled with mostly morbid items, so mostly funerary goods, most, lots of mummies. The British Museum has more mummies off display than it has on display, despite it having a whole floor dedicated to human remains of, and mummies. Um, and that has also led to this uh, bias of interest in um, ex exhibitions that we see even today being promoted. So there's Ramesses in gold, there's Tutankhamun a few years ago, there's um, to a certain extent, uh, you know, the gold of the pharaohs and a little bit the hieroglyphs exhibition as well that uh, ha we had here last year mostly showed uh, papyri that came from tombs as well. So that is all kind of self-perpetuated until I suppose the late 20th century when archaeologists started to get interested in the everyday uh, people and wanted to then think about where were the Egyptians living? What were they eating? How were they eating? Where, you know, where was their court structure? Where was their politics? Where were they farming? What were they, you know, how were they doing that? And so on and so forth. And what did their houses look like? Um, and that then led to um, a, a beginning of um, interest in settlement archeology. span But it had its own problems, of course, because if we think about how we live, whenever we uh, are finished with our, if we break a, a, a pot or we break our, our plates, they go into the bin, they go off to the, hopefully, to the, to the waste disposal areas and it's out of sight and out of mind. But in the past, what they tended to do, they didn't always have waste disposal and it often ended up in the back rooms of houses or in, in the, in, on the street and so and things got churned about and pushed around and, and in so doing got more and more broken. So uh, the items that you get from settlements aren't always as beautiful as the ones as we get from tombs, is my kind of point there. And, but however, tombs do not give us the full picture. The best sources are texts, objects, settlement archaeology, and tomb paintings. And this, for example, is one of the excavations that I was working at with the University of Liverpool. You might just about be able to see me there. I'm looking very grubby in the background. Um, and we're excavating some very dusty and dirty pottery kilns right here. This is a sort of half of a very large three meter kiln. Um, and it's, it's only through fully uh, understanding how these people were living what they were doing day to day, that we get the full picture of the society. So, that leads me back to tombs. But, um, but, but unlike our gravestones and our ordinary um, sort of tombs where we don't know too much about our ancestors from how they were, how they're depicted in, in, uh, on, their, on their gravestones, the ancient Egyptians left us with some incredible 
um, scenes. And I want to, be just because they're so pretty, I want to share some with you this evening, um, just because I can. Um, so, uh, and it does show, I hope, that they were more obsessed with life uh, through some of the glorious scenes such as because we're in, in Lisburn and it's the centre of flax production and, and weaving, you see here, this is Senegem and his wife, and they're pulling uh, flax from, uh, from their farm. But you'll notice, I hope, that they're in absolutely gorgeous linen clothes. And the, his wife here is in a beautiful pleated dress, which is fringed. And, um, and, and it's up, you know, and she's got her gorgeous hair, uh, probably her wig on, while they're busy out in the fields. Um, and in, in the tomb of Nebamun, uh, you can see these uh, scenes of banqueting where uh, Nebamun and his wife are at the top here with a beautiful display of fruit and, and uh, flowers and, and uh, lots of nice things. And then underneath are a series of gentlemen seated uh, with, with um, some, some waitresses bringing drinks to them. And then below here are uh, some women that have, um, these are, they're sometimes called funerary cones, but they're, they're perfume cones. And they're a little bit disgusting, but what they like to do was place wax cones on top of their hair, which during the evening slowly melted into their hair and left a beautiful smell. Um, not really, well, I think it's because they probably wore wigs and it, they didn't really have deodorant in those days, so it's sort of um, a pre-deodorant, if you like. But in these tombs, what they're highlighting is the best, the best things that have happened in their life or an enjoyment of life. And it also is sometimes where they um, showcase their achievements and um, the, their jobs that they might have. So some really like to, sh to share that they were tax collectors. Um, it's a, lot of, a lot of them seem to be accountants, actually, which probably tells you a bit about the elites uh, today as well. And a lot of the time they are military campaigners or key members of, um, of the Egyptian court who were able to, to showcase themselves and to pay for painters and decorators to um, glorify their lives in both paint and in text. Uh, and, and it's to, a, a way to sort of showcase how wonderful they were, as you know, we always want to do, we want to show ourselves in the best light. Um, and it really goes to the extreme in some cases where uh, we get to understand a little bit what daily life might have been like, or at least elements of it. So in, um, in this sarcophagus of, of Cowet, you can see she's with her hairdresser, uh, and her hairdresser is very delicately arranging her hair and you know, making sure it's nice and tightly braided and she's got a ribbon on top. And while she's doing that, she's got a, her mirror so she can check that the work is proceeding correctly. And uh, she's having a nice glass of wine, uh, which an extra is being poured by her attendant. So, you know, that's like going to the salon on a Saturday today, I'd say, you know, nice glass of Prosecco. Um, and we also have here, again, I wanted to showcase some of the really almost um, damask-like linen garments, really diaphanously pleated and gorgeous of these ladies here. Uh, and they've got beautiful beaded collars on, lovely gold earrings and, and headbands. And they're having some fruit together and uh, smelling a beautiful lily lotus uh, flower. And again, they've got these little cones. Now here, you can see this one's partially melted. So you know it's a little bit later on in the evening. So they're maybe a bit merry at this stage. Um, and this is from the tomb of Nacht. So you can see that, you know, in these sort of scenes, they're really showing how wonderful life can be. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, we all love a party today. So very much the same sort of thing going on. But um, so, what I wanted to talk a little bit about now is, is about the people who um, painted or decorated these tomb scenes and why and, and who decided what was depicted in each tomb. No tomb is the same. They do follow several kind of standard practices in how uh, the, ar the artist depicted their, their people. So 
um, you can see here they're mostly slightly awkwardly positioned. So you, you, the head tends to be in profile while the upper torso is um, face on. As you can see here, with, um, we're back with the Tomb of Nacht and then their legs are um, in profile again. The idea is that you can see all aspects of the person uh, so that um, in the afterlife they made sure that they were whole and complete. Um, and you can see that in this case, um, it, Nacht is, uh, although he describes himself as, as, a, as a scribe and astronomer of the Temple of Amun as his key main title, here he's showcasing himself as an estate owner capable of, um, of paying for uh, lots of um, land, land laborers, laborers to work for him while he sits in his bower. It's a nice sort of bower here and a lovely chair um, and has his staff of, of kind of authority, uh, which he may have used on occasion. We don't quite know from this scene, but this showcases um, all of the key moments in the agricultural calendar from um, from ploughing down at the bottom here with um, some unruly oxen through to um, damming and moving water and irrigating the land and uh, removing some scrubland trees. And then above here uh, uh, is um, the flax and, and, sorry, in this case it's wheat being um, checked over by these ladies again in perfectly thin dresses that you wouldn't really want to have out in the fields but anyway we're showcasing the best life possible I suppose and then uh, the the harvesting of um, of the wheat when it's turned golden brown using using sickles here and gathering them up in huge nets and then bringing them up to um, to the winnowing area in the barn where uh, they're then winnowing using uh, these, um, these scoops, these winnowing fans to separate the wheat from the chaff and then get it ready for either um, baking into some nice bread or storing in the granary to then be distributed as salaries. And in, the, in Egypt, they, before the Romans came, they didn't have coinage. So all of the, the salaries were uh, in the form of either, either wheat sometimes beer and um, a lot of vegetables. The Egyptians seem to pay people a lot in onions and garlic. So it must have been interesting for the breath, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, uh, and also linen. They also paid people in linen too. Um, and so again, this is, although, although Nacht is an astronomer and he works at the temple mostly, in this case, he's also, he can be many things and he's showcasing his, his, uh, all of his bounty, if you like. So Egyptian wall scenes were typically depicted um, using, uh, first of all, you would carve out uh, the, the sections of, or however big that you wanted your tomb to be, usually out of sandstone. Most of the Egyptian geology is sandstone. Very occasionally it's limestone. But, um, and they would have copper chisels and wooden mallets to do that and have a constant blacksmith there probably to resharpen as they go. Um, but we get a sense uh, from some of these scenes that uh, painters and decorators worked hand in hand while the tomb was being constructed and also had a variety of other tasks as well. And you can see here, uh, the, this is a, um, a large statue of, the, of a king being depicted because he has a white crown here and a little, uh, a little snake head. So we know that this is a king. Um, and, um, and he's also striding forth in a very manly way, as they tend to do. Um, and we can see here they've got scaffolding rigged up. And while the, the stone masons are working and polishing which was well, probably granite in this case. There's painters at the back who are filling in the, the, the hieroglyphs that were carved at the back to um, highlight the king's titles and names. Um, and we have some idea of some of the people who uh, were painters and decorators because they themselves wrote about their work. And um, you can see 
here we know of one called Erisen who lived around 2000 BC and he, he said, I know the secret of the hieroglyph. I am a craftsman excellent in his craft, preeminent on account of what he has known. I can render the step forward of the male statue, the steps of the female statue, the movement of the wings of dozens of birds, the posture of someone committing a captive, and the expression of his counterpart. So he wasn't a modest man, but, um, but he definitely showcased that he knew what he was doing, and he was probably a master craftsman, um, and probably worked on statues such as this one. And we also have from some tombs the uh, scribal palette here, or the artist's palette, with various different colours. Uh, the Egyptians had at least five colours, sometimes six, that they used. Um, and we have here a sort of uh, burnt black, so it's sometimes um, charcoal black. They, they had a green uh, that was formed of copper carbonate and a blue from cobalt. They had a red and yellow which came from different types of ochre as well. And, uh, and they mixed those either with um, a sort of gum arabic, sometimes they mixed it with resins, uh, and sometimes just water in order to attach the paint. So uh, the paint is often the first thing that flakes off, unfortunately, um, unless it's on pottery uh, because it gets fired in the kiln uh, beforehand, particularly if they used cobalt blue, which is why um, in some museum collections you'll see a lot of blue painted pottery because the blue is, is this cobalt blue which is fired on before um, uh, as it's part of the firing process, whereas most of the other paints are added afterwards. Anyway, so um, we also get a good sense of uh, what the daily life might have been like from some of your everyday tombs, your average tombs, if you like. So, uh, and we get the sense that they were quite similar to us, apart from the whole digital mobile phones and so on. But, um, the ordinary person tended to be uh, to, to have items that they would have every day. So this gentleman here was buried with his sandals, for example. Um, lots of people had necklaces and bracelets made of different types of beads and shells. Um, and we also get lots of game encounters and game boards as well. This is um, a, a game called Senate. Uh, it's a little bit like um, chess, where you're sort of trying to steal your opponent's co uh, counters. And it's something that um, some archaeologists have worked out how, how you play it, and it's very like chess. Um, sort of a combination between chess and, and checkers, I suppose. Um, so tombs have their use for understanding your daily life and some of the things that they might have been doing. And of course, we also have lots and lots of pottery. Um, which I love and is really helpful for understanding the dating, but also um, you know kind of what people were eating and drinking from, and storage. In the pre-refrigeration age, pots buried into the soil, where into the sand even in Egypt's case, uh, where your where your refrigerator, and if you sealed it up, you uh, it was you know, very effective. It's a little bit like in. Uh, in Northern Ireland where we get, um, sometimes we get uh, butter stored in bogs and, it's, and with the acidity and the anaerobic um, conditions of the soil it, it, it preserves very well. So for the ancient Irish and, and Northern Irish that was, um, I suppose that was your refrigerator but it tended to be a bit more pickled, whereas in this case it's a lot drier and air dried. And that led me to sort of start to think about um, the differences between everyday objects in the tomb and everyday objects from settlements. So, for example, a lot of tombs from what's known as the Middle Kingdom, which is um, around um, 1500 BC, have these really, really lovely little daily life scenes um, of um, little wooden models that depict uh, sort of things like baking bread, um, grinding uh, wheat, um, and, sh and brewing beer and it tends these again are in uh, the sort of tombs where 
I suppose they want to make sure that they have all their servants and all the people who used to do these things for them in, in life also in the tomb with them so that the tomb owner didn't have to do these sort of things for themselves. So they made sure that they had them represented both in 3D form and sometimes also on their um, tomb scenes as well. Um, and what we also get, uh, uh, we get a snippet of the sort of ethnographic aspect of how these processes might have worked from these little models. So we get the sense of here's somebody's preparing uh, some bread and kneading some bread. This little guy has lost his pot, but he would be mashing um, some, uh, probably some, some wheat into, into flour. And then here, this gentleman is pouring uh, the dough into these, into these containers to, to, um, to rise for a little while or ferment for a bit. But also from excavations, we get um, these uh, large pots coming up, um, which are bread moulds for pouring dough into. And then they would um, put a lid on top, pop it into the fire and, um, and bake the bread um, in that way using the pot and then they could reuse it several times until it kind of fell apart um, and that got me interested in um, trying that out for myself uh, and seeing how well it worked mixed results um, but if anyone if anyone is a gamer and knows Seamus Blackley he's uh, the founder of Xbox and during lockdown, as lots of nerds tend to do, he got quite interested in um, ancient Egyptian bread. And he worked with archaeologist Serena Love and microbiologist Richard Bowman. And they extracted yeast from uh, the sort of the bottoms of pots, the bases of pots, and, um, and managed to recreate uh, some of the ancient yeast strains that the ancient Egyptians did. And then they, um, from that, uh, added lots of nutrients, fed the yeast uh, and added some sugars and heat and you know, got them going again and added water and ancient grains. And then they were able to bake bread. Now, I didn't have that at my disposal, <laughs> um, but I was able to um, use... I kind of used a, uh, a method of extracting yeast from the air where if you, essentially if you, um, my parents would like this very much, but when I grew up, when I was growing up, I got very interested in how uh, fruits um, degrade and go mouldy. And um, one of the ways that the, uh, you can extract yeast is if you leave fruit to go mouldy. <laughs> my mum's looking at me at the minute uh, and so I did this again and uh, that led uh, yeast to start to grow on the mouldy grapes that I left out and then I started to feed that yeast and add sugar to it and left it in the warm added uh, some some flour to it and some slightly warm water and fed it for a few days and, uh, and until it started to bubble and started to look a bit like a sourdough starter, if anyone during lockdown got into the sourdough interests. Um, and then I added uh, some more flour and uh, fed it a bit more. And I wanted to try and recreate um, this sort of bread mould. Now, I didn't have that to hand but I could go to my local garden centre and got lots of little terracotta pots. So these little guys. So this is my wild yeast and my and adding my uh, to my dough, and uh, then I left them there to to rise and they rose, and uh, and then this is my result of my little uh, little bit of bread. So uh, it's all it is possible and it, it's a uh, it tasted interesting. It was quite difficult to get out of the terracotta pot. Um, you have to oil it a lot more than I did, but. Um, Work, work in progress there. <laughs> um, I suppose that's something to do during lockdown. Um, but right, so what else we can kind of glean from not just experimental reconstructions of craft is um, evidence from settlement archaeology. Now I kind of plugged that at the beginning a little bit that I think settlement <laughs> archaeology is a bit more interesting than tombs, in my humble opinion at least. And I wanted to take us for a little while 
to the, the town of Daryl Medina. Uh, if you picture yourself in, uh, in ancient Luxor, we're on the west bank of Thebes and we're heading towards the Valley of the Kings. This is where the workers who built the Valley of the Kings lived. And they're a really interesting bunch of people because they lived there with their, their wives and partners and spouses and children in this very densely clustered walled town. And it seemed that they didn't always get along very well. And because they were artists and painters and had artistic temperaments, presumably, um, but they also, usefully for us, were mostly literate. And a lot of them wrote letters to each other complaining, gossiping, slandering, lots of other things. And um, some very helpful e Egyptologists before me have translated some of those for us. Uh, and so I thought I'd share a few of those this evening. And we get a sense of the ancient voice um, of these ordinary folk, if you like. So, um, so for example, uh, if we look at uh, Kunamose here, this isn't actually him, but this is a nice little scene. Uh, he reminds his friend Ruti of the favours he has done for him. So basically, I plastered three places on the top of his house and likewise the staircase of his tomb. And his wife spent 40 days dwelling with me in my house. And I looked after her and gave her a sack of wheat and 10 associated loaves and he threw her out. And she spent 20 days at Mena's place, so another person's house. So here we get a sense of this poor chap spent all this time redecorating his mate's house and his tomb. And for some reason, he got upset and kicked his wife out and sent him to um, another person's house. And so you get this sense that um, it's not always beautiful in the past. Life isn't always easy. And then um, if we turn to this other character, the scribe Nacht Sobek, oh sorry, Aminacht, who writes to his friend the scribe, and he's basically being ghosted by his friend, I think, in this. In this. So, um, what's the matter with you? Please write to me your state of mind so that I may enter into it. Indeed, since I was, a, I was a child until today, and when I'm with you, I can't understand your character. Will it be good for a man when he has to say something to his friend twice and he doesn't listen? Like the ointment which I asked from you and you told me I will send it to you and now I don't have any. Poor man, you know, his, his friend is ghosting him and not speaking to him. It's worse than Tinder, you know, kind of thing going on. So what I get from this is that the Egyptians were just like us, really. <laughs> they had a rough time of it. They didn't have a great life all the time. Not everything was rosy, despite what they show in their tombs. And, um, and that's all the better for it. We, under, you know, we get a good sense now that, yeah, their lives weren't perfect, our lives aren't perfect, and that's okay. And we do fall out sometimes. So now I want to look a little bit more about the, uh, an understanding of what general life was like. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to look at a few, uh, a few things. So um, people always ask about, uh, did they get married? What was it like to be um, a woman there? Uh, did, did they have much uh, autonomy or not? Um, and we know that the ancient Greeks, for example, weren't great with their women, but the Egyptians were fairly sound generally. Marriage contracts were drawn up sometimes, not always. They didn't necessarily have to get married. In this case, I'm afraid I'm talking about heterosexual marriage, not just the general rather than anything more interesting. But marriage is, was basically referred to as the founding of a house. A bit like today, you get your mortgage first and then you get married because there's more of a binding contract in the mortgage generally. And the bride also owned her own personal items that she brought to the marriage. And those were known as um, the goods of a woman. And these were usually her bed. She brought the bed to the house, also mirrors, clothing and other objects, but they also owned the house equally. And we know from Egyptian law, at least during what's known as the New Kingdom, so it's around 1500 BC to 11th, 1100 to 1000 BC, 1000 BC, sorry, 
that both the husband and the wife were jointly uh, you know, as important as the other. That's very useful to know that we get a sense that actually, again, they're very similar to us. So I now I thought I'd take us a little bit further south uh, to one of the sites that I worked on with the British Museum um, over 10 years ago now uh, in, in Sudan, which is sadly having a lot of um, turmoil and political problems. Uh, and we, we hope it returns to normality soon. Um, but I'm going to take us down the Nile beyond Thebes, where um, Daryl Medina is located. And we're going to a site known as Amara West, which was an Egyptian colony during um, the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. So around 1200 BC. Um, and it, it was a, very, a sort of Egyptian colony. It was a walled town, but it also had its own temple here. And it also had various suburbs that developed outside of the town as it grew. But I want to look together at um, area E13, as it's known. Um, I'm afraid archaeologists aren't very original with how they describe places. So we tend to use grids a lot. So it's E13, I'm afraid, um, that we're going to. But um, I wanted to showcase um, several uh, parts of the town that has survived incredibly well. Some at over three, the walls are over three meters tall and you can literally walk through this town um, after a lot of excavation, hard work, I have to say. But um, uh, and we get uh, this idea of, um, of how people were living so far away from, from their home uh, land and um, resettling in, in a location. So. I was tasked with excavating this area, so house 13.5, uh, and they wanted me to get it down to this sort of area in about a month. So that was fun. <laughs> it's the British Museum, they work you hard. Um, and um, so just to show you from, a, from above what that looks like as I was going. So um, that's me there. Uh, but uh, so this was the oh, this was the house here. Uh, so this is the front door here, and as you go into a sort of vestibule area, and up here is the staircase, and then in the back here, this is the sofa known as it's called the mastaba, the bench, and then a sort of little side room here, and then there was um, a kitchen off to one side with several ovens. But we'll look at this in more detail as we go. This photograph is taken from a kite because in Sudan you're not allowed to bring drones in. So this is a kite with a, a very expensive camera dangling from the top of it. Um, my colleague Susie did all of this amazing kite work and we'll have a look in a bit at uh, uh, some of the images that she took. And this is just to highlight the, where I was working. Um, and while we were working, uh, at this site. I obviously didn't do it on my own. I had a, a, a really great set of co Sudanese colleagues who worked with me and here's just two of them. So this is um, Adley and Mickey who are local archaeologists. And um, while we were excavating the back portion, so I'll just go back to where we are. So we were excavating in this area. I moved into the, the second house to the rear. This is the, the city wall, as you can see here, nice and thick city wall. So while we were getting closer to the edge of the city wall, the houses got more and more squashed and um, people were obviously subdividing and redividing rooms. Um, so I was working in here, which had several uh, doors closed at one stage. Oops, sorry. Um, and while we were working there, um, this is Mickey here. He's uh, excavating three giant ovens um, just in one corner of the room. And this is it a bit more cleaned up. This is an action shot, if you like. So you can see here these three ovens with a giant pot that for some reason was embedded into this oven. And it was the Dickens to get it out. <laughs> we had to use a pickaxe in the end to get it out. And it seemed like they were using it as an oven within an oven. 
um, and they seem to have been smoking fish inside because there was lots of fish skeletons. Um, and this was a sort of kitchen, so there was a, a grinding area and you can see this is, this, this is a, mo a model of the kind of bakery scene. So this is sort of probably closer to what the grinding stone would have looked like whenever it was um, uh, fully formed. Uh, and then there was a whole spread of charcoal from the ovens. And while I was digging the charcoal and getting progressively dirty and covered in ash, um, I un uncovered a little pottery sherd up here, uh, which had a little curve of something really very exciting. So it was a little necklace. And this was just right here, actually. Yeah, right here. Um, and in it, it had uh, faience beads, which are a kind of a step between glass and pottery, uh, where, where they added copper uh, carbonate to it to give it a green color. And then on either side were two little carnelian beads and in the centre was a little bit of beaten gold. So I did find a bit of gold. And I know I'm not supposed to be that interested because I'm a settlement archaeologist, but it was still very exciting. So this is my big find. So I had to share it with you all. Um, and it's now in the museum in Khartoum, which I hope it's still OK. <laughs> um, fingers crossed. Um, and that then led me to what I want to look at next is uh, the kitchen area so here to the side we get a sense that um, the kitchens were probably shared by these two houses uh, so there's a doorway that goes in through here to the back to a set of kitchen and ovens here while they they'd closed up this kitchen and it was full of rubbish and debris which is exactly what an archaeologist wants to dig the rubbish is the best bit it's where you get all the nice stuff um, and then on the other side this is the main street uh, that they possibly accessed their ovens in here and their kitchen in here. So we've, we find some quite interesting um, things as part of the, the kitchen. So this is our main house and this is what we called the oven court. And it showed that there was, um, it was probably a kitchen because it had no cultic objects, no ritual objects lots of undecorated pottery, lots of processing kind of tools, and it was full of ash. Um, so we get the sense that it was being used all the time and, um, and was producing a lot of dirt and ash, and it, which didn't have anywhere to go, really. They could sweep it out into the street a bit, but what seems to be is they just let it sort of fill up and fill up, and then they kind of closed the door, shut it off, and forgot about it, which is perfect for us 4,000 years later when we wanted to dig it up. Um, and then... Uh, so this is the kind of type of clay oven when it was fully formed and, um, and they would have placed flat breads inside. If anyone has eaten kind of pita breads or kind of um, flat breads or wraps, that's kind of very similar to how they would do it in the traditional tanur oven. So you would pop it slightly wet onto the inside of the oven and it would cook beautifully in the inside and then take it out and eat it. And this is exactly what's being shown in the tomb of Senate here, where these round loaves are being prepared and then they're popping them into the top of the oven. And then uh, in the next scene, which I'm not showing, sorry, it's lovely and cooked because it's turned a brown colour. But you get the sense of what was going on from these daily life scenes. So daily life scenes in tombs are sometimes very useful for settlements because we can you know, work together. It's OK. We can work together. Um, and this is just to show you in more detail these ovens. So uh, what you sort of get before they get excavated is you can see these nice circular structures and you think, ah, more ovens and ovens and ovens. And it's very ashy. And you know that you're going to just be covered in ash by the end of the, the day, which is very exciting. But I just wanted to show you some of the 3D model of the site, which, we, which Susie, my colleague, did through uh, using her kite and doing multiple photographs, which is known as photogrammetry, and you then stitch it all together. Uh, and so this is just to show you the different rooms. So this is the back room uh, of House E 13.15, and this is the, the sofa, the mastaba bench. And this is the set of ovens at the back, 
the three ovens here, now with the giant pot removed, because it happened at the end. And then this is the doorway that got blocked up later as they had had enough of all of the dirt and ash, and they moved away. And then, oops, and then this is the other set of ovens with the doorway just here. Oops, I'm a bit quick there. And there we go. And that just shows you just one little section of one settlement, which we can find out quite a lot about. Um, in the last five minutes, sorry, I've talked too much. Um, in the last five minutes, I'll have a little look at some of the things that you might find within a house. But a lot of them have actually come from tombs. So, because they're complete, the pictures anyway. So, um, we, although a in, a, in a lot of the houses in Amara West, we had this sort of sofa, maybe sofa bed type type structure often at the back of the house so it may have been more like the living room or the sort of communal space um, and bedrooms were these sort of bedrooms were likely to be more like public spaces so you sort of think of a privy chamber or you know where you might go and visit the king in Henry VIII's time um, where they might conduct private business during the day and then in the evening it swapped over to being a, um, a bed room uh, and we it's we also get a lot of headrests rather than pillows um, which is quite alien in a way to us in the west to think of having a headrest to to lie on um, but it is very good for the neck I'm told um, and it's very good for your posture ultimately so I think if, if there's any osteo people in the room they might like to uh, have us all using those instead of pillows um, People always ask me about bathrooms, so I thought I'd show you what bathrooms looked like, at least in um, one site. This is at Tel El Amarna, um, where uh, Tutankhamun's father built a city out in, in uh, the desert. Um, a lot of his gentry had all the mod cons while they were there. So in the larger homes next to the master bedroom, they would have um, this sort of water shower area the slab, usually made of limestone, where they would uh, have this sort of um, drainage system which would go out and spill into a, a spout into the pot below. And then someone per person would have to lift that out and you know, take it out and dump it for them. But um, that's for someone else's job, I suppose. Um, and just to give you a sense of the layout of, of uh, a lot of these similar period houses, just like at Amara West, um, they tended to have a sort of porch area, the bigger houses at least, and an outer hall, and then a central hall with a hearth and um, this sort of sofa, this dais, this mastaba. Maybe it would have a second floor. And then at the rear, it would have the more private rooms, the bedroom, the bathroom, and possibly a loo. And this is one of the larger houses at, at Amarna. Um, and everyone wants to know what a toilet might have looked like. Here we go. So. Uh, there's a few examples of those at Amarna. This one um, is uh, now in the Cairo Museum because everyone wants to see it. But it's a, it's a lot like a long drop or a medieval kind of latrine type thing. So you would have a, sometimes a pot underneath, literally, um, uh, or sometimes you would have a, a large pit that had been dug. And then uh, the posher houses would have this special toilet seat that they could sit on and it, go in comfort. Um, and some of the smaller houses would have more of a sort of shower room and then they probably went when it, wherever they could find somewhere to go rather than having a formal loo. Not everyone could afford it, of course. Finally, furniture. This doesn't survive so well, but in the very dry climate of Egypt, we do get some, some lovely wooden furniture that does survive. And again, these are mostly from tombs. The um, termites often eat away at, uh, at wood in, in Egypt, but we do get some lovely kind of folding stools and chairs. And we've seen from some of the tomb scenes earlier that they did have quite formal chairs as well. 
Um, they would have used kind of local wood that was available. They had very ingenious carpenters who created you know, tables and they also had lots of boxes. They could create inlays and, and uh, all kinds of um, handles and all sorts of things. So they did have um, many of the things that we, ha that we have today, but they used quite different types of wood. So your acacia wood, your palm tree, and the sycamore to a certain extent. Uh, but if they didn't have pine, unfortunately, because of course that comes from kind of Northern Europe. So they had to rely on what they had locally. They sometimes imported cedar from uh, nearby Lebanon, but um, their indigenous wood sources were not many. Um, so what they had, they um, made the best of, as we all do, I suppose. Okay. Uh, oh, we just wanted to kind of finish with a slightly funny thing. So um, in contrast to our beautiful, large Amarna houses, um, the everyday folk that came and lived and helped to build the pyramids were mostly housed in barracks. And in 2004, um, the, uh, the Harvard Institute uh, came and excavated one of these barracks. Uh, and you can see it's a very long, um, thin structure uh, where known as galleries really and it had a long set of column bases in, in the centre and the Egyptian archaeologists had great fun showing how they might sleep every night <laughs> altogether. Quite contrast to uh, the beautiful big houses at Amarna and Amara West um, and then they, once they'd finished their work they'd then go home again uh, after a few months hard labour. So thank you so much for listening and uh, great to talk to you. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was fascinating. Um, we have some time for some questions, if you're willing. Um, do we have any questions on the floor there? Maybe just when we're thinking about that, can I bring up something that I thought was dead interesting? We were chatting earlier on. Um, you had a really um, interesting way of expertise meeting pop culture, and you were doing streaming gameplays of Assassin's Creed Ancient Egypt where your, your friend was playing and you were commenting on that game as an Egyptologist. I'm just wondering if you could talk a wee bit about that. I thought it was a great way of engaging people. Yes, I don't know if anyone's ever played Assassin's Creed, but they have an Ancient Egypt um, uh, program and um, it has a what's known as a discovery area where you don't have to play the game where you sort of fight folk and find stuff. You can just wander through an Egyptian town and um, they've done it beautifully all in 3D and you can walk through it and I do use some of the the scenes sometimes with my students but um, basically my, my, my friend Gemma played it and we walked through these different houses, these different marketplaces. We went on a boat and went down the Nile and we looked about us and while I was there we were, I kind of commented on particularly the ancient craft, because that's something I'm really interested in, is Egyptian technology and how they were representing the sort of everyday life scenes. Um, and we got some great questions from, from the audience, like, did the Egyptians have toothpaste? And how, you know, were there crocodiles? And if so, like, did many people get eaten? You know, how bad are hippos? Things like that. So it's a really great and accessible way of um, bringing Egypt to life. And Assassin's Creed did a great job in most cases, you know, so it was, and it was a really accessible way of engaging teenagers in particular who play. Um, unfortunately, they haven't issued a new series yet, so hoping for the next one coming out. <laughs> and then I'll be on Twitch again, maybe. <laughs> Could you tell me what sort of uh, life did people have? Did they, I mean, it, was, it wasn't all just cooking in the kitchen and uh, <laughs> getting buried. Uh, did they have, uh, now you, you saw their uh, uh, game of chess, but did they have sport and did they uh, have recreation and horse racing and uh, those sort of things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't have time really to go into some I mean, of those. I mean, the ordinary people, not just the, oh, yes. the pharaohs. And the yeah, absolutely. So they maybe didn't do horse racing so much, but because um, uh, the horse was quite an elite 
item whenever it came, um, but whenever it came to Egypt from, from Turkey at the time. But they did have a form of hockey that they played and they did do some amazing gymnastics. They had did gymnastics. They definitely wrestled. We see in tomb scenes that there's wrestling um, and they, they loved a festival. They had lots of public holidays where basically it's really useful having lots of gods because they each needed a festival. Um, and so they had more public holidays than we did really and um, they would have during these feast days might be the only time that they would actually eat meat and they tended to eat um, they would tend to sacrifice a, you know a cow and sometimes a hippo uh, which is a very vicious animal you wouldn't really want to do that too often um, and that would be the time when they would all shit, have a barbecue have a party drink a lot of beer and wine and garlic and onions and um, just have have a great time and play music um, they were quite uh, known for be for their harp playing and um, and singing as well uh, so yeah very much you know it wasn't all um, getting ready for, for dying it was very much um, yes they had to spend a lot of time working in the fields your average person but some of them had you know very interesting jobs as well so uh, we know from a text called the satire of the trades, which um, kind of makes fun of some of the jobs that people did do. But um, there is, you know, there is the pot, potter. A potter was the very common in most villages. Uh, there were hunters who would go out and catch geese or you know wild birds, and there was fishermen. Um, there was blacksmithing and metalworking and jewellers, you know, you name it, you know, they, 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 they had the job. So very similar and weavers too. So yeah, they were busy. They were busy, I think. Formal education? Um, probably less formal. They, they, did have, they did have some schools, but most people weren't literate. You're maybe your one, two percent of the population would learn to read and write. So, um, but they would have probably have learnt from their parents, whatever their parents knew and sort of handed it on, um, rather than uh, kind of formal schooling. You had to go to a, an elite school and be taught in that way. Uh, what type of clothing did the gentlemen wear? Oh, they, they, ha they wore linen. They almost all exclusively wore very fine linen kilts, mostly. Um, they, uh, we know that they also had underwear uh, but it, they, it was sort of more like a nappy um, that they would, so they would sort of tie a, a loincloth on. So the, the term gird your loins comes from the kind of tying the loincloth on. And then on top of that, they would have had um, a, a linen kilt uh, made with a kind of very, it, as, as well as fine as they could afford. The Egyptians, a bit like um, us today, had several different weaves of, of, of linen, um, ranging from kind of almost like jute right the way through to as thin as damask uh, would be. Uh, but they would probably have only used the, the finest linen for uh, their special parties and occasions. Um, they didn't tend to wear, some of them wore a sort of over kind of um, sort of a sort of a not quite a jacket but they'd sort of fold it over a little bit like a toga style um, but again because of it's such a hot climate uh, they tended to wear quite loose baggy clothing that they could reuse and retie um, they didn't have a they didn't have zips or buttons so a lot of their clothes were just two seams down each side and or a big long sheath of linen that they would then fold in elaborate ways um, so they had a, they didn't have trousers as such. They only wore um, either a loincloth when they were working in muddy kind of conditions or a very fancy um, kilt whenever Galabia. they're feeling posh. Pardon me? Galabia? A galabia is what they would wear today. So yes, it's very similar to the galabia. Yeah, yeah. But um, in linen and folded and pleated and very and starched. Sarah, the um, Romans and the Greeks have left a tremendous legacy on their thinking, the thinking of the, not so much the people who may not have been so literate, but certainly the ruling classes did, and left us a legacy of their thinking on law, 
uh, morals and such things. Do we know anything about what the ruling classes of the ancient Egyptians thought about everyday life and the way, way life should be run and governed uh, as, a, as a society overall? Oh, uh, great question. Um, well, we, we do have some papyri that does speak to that. Uh, so we know that they, um, they wrote quite a lot of uh, what are called the teachings, teachings to kind of young people of how you should behave and it's mostly to do with you will obey your parents above all things um, and you know otherwise you'll get beaten and uh, there's a, a phrase that they often use as a you know a boy's ear is on his bottom kind of sort of thing uh, and he'll only listen if uh, the stick is used unfortunately um, but in terms of sort of laws uh, we we have less surviving on, on those sort of things. I think mostly because a lot of the libraries were uh, destroyed, like the great Al Alexandrian library was, um, was burned. And so a lot of the big repositories for uh, those sort of laws have gone. Um, there is a cache of letters known as the Amarna letters, which were not written in hieroglyphs, but were written in um, cuneiform, which was sort of like the English of its day. So they would tr take, um, they were sending out documents to um, other courts about um, sort of diplomatic uh, ties and requests for uh, trade or for items. Um, and this, that sort of gave us, that sort of gives us a sense of their global reach at the time. So they certainly were speaking to their equivalents in Mesopotamia, in Turkey, um, and in, in south into Sudan and Ethiopia and to Eritrea and Yemen. So we know that they had quite a wide circle. Um, but in terms of what they thought about the ordinary folk, um, I mentioned a bit earlier about the satire of the trades uh, where they make the, the people who are literate, and that's just the kind of one, two percent of the population, were making fun of people who were less well off than they were. And, and it was a treatise again to a young person um, from an elite father saying, that you don't want to be a potter because his nose is perpetually in the earth and dirt and it's smelly. You want to be a scribe and to aspire to something better, um, which is again is quite uh, human with a lot of parents today. They want, don't necessarily want them to be in the trades, which is a shame because we need our plumbers and electricians, um, probably a bit more than we need our archeologists, but um, yeah. So we get a, some ideas of what they thought. Uh, from these ancient texts. Thank you. Sarah, a much simpler question by contrast. Could I ask please about the decorative collars that the ladies wore? Oh, yeah. And um, were they of a fabric backing or heavy and metallic? Um, they were mostly beaded, Jane. They mostly were lots of different colours of beads that, they, um, that were very delicately strung together um, with uh, sometimes with gold, depend, you know, lots of you know, really ornate and very quite, really quite heavy as well whenever you, you wore them and you would sort of, as, as you move it kind of rattles and shakes so you can hear someone coming. Exactly, yeah. So it's almost like, you know, almost like wearing bells I suppose. <laughs> so it's, yeah, really, it would be, and it would be very striking and I, I imagine that they would try to outdo each other. In, in some cases, they're, all, they're floral as well. They, they made some amazing floral garlands. Um, they loved using uh, lilies in particular uh, and uh, different types of um, sort of pomegranate uh, fruit. And uh, they also love to use foliage and um, I think it's uh, Bourgainvillea, which is a very beautiful pink colour. Uh, and so, and we know that they use these because they did end up as garlands on mummies and they do survive as sort of dried flowers. Uh, and you can sometimes uh, smell the, the scent still. So, it was, you know, they very much wanted them for their perfume. Again, not having deodorant. <laughs> Important. <laughs> Thanks. What's the most 
what you found yourself? Oh, uh, it was probably the necklace that I showed you uh, with, with the gold. But um, I've also found a child's shoe, uh, which was um, partly made of leather in the sole, and it had been very delicately tooled. I think it was probably for a toddler, um, and it was, yeah, really, really delicate, and we had to uh, put it straight into water, so that was quite, quite fun, because uh, it was in a slightly waterlogged deposit. Um, so, yeah, that's probably one of my, my second better one. Oh, and I, I also got a, found a huge blue painted pot that was about this high. It was very, diff very heavy and it was um, embedded into a floor. And these sort of pots were normally the type that would be in temples full, full of wine, but it had somehow ended up its life in an ordinary person's house embedded into the floor with its lid chopped off and they were using it to put water in. Uh, so it ended up having a, a rather sad end, but at least it was being recycled. Uh, but it was beautifully decorated with lots of um, uh, blue paint and, and flowers and garlands and all sorts of things. So it was gorgeous. Yeah, thank you. Join me in thanking um, Sarah for a wonderful talk this evening. Thank you, Sarah.